Hallelujah. <laughs> we have a pastor at home who says, this is hallelujah and this is amen. And this is why. <laughs> okay. You know, the gospel this morning is an interesting one. And I'll explain a little bit more as we go through it. But that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, which did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was so short. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear this is the word of God in the house of God. Thanks be to God. What makes what makes this gospel interesting? I don't know how many of you know this, but that was the very first parable that Jesus used. And you know, after this. He, uh, he spoke in parables a lot. He never really came out and told you, I better behave myself today. When I roam around, I forget where I'm at. Uh, he, uh, he, he never told you right out what he wanted to say. He always gave you a story. And then you had to figure out what it meant. But he did this for several reasons. Number one, there were a lot of people who didn't believe in him and who didn't understand him and who didn't really want to have anything to do with him. So he would give them a parable and it would confuse them. And it made them think a little bit. But his disciples, who had been waiting for so long, knew him very well. And they knew exactly what he was saying. So he could speak to them and give them instruction without anybody else understanding what he was doing. Well, he was very good at parables. And after this, he used parables all the time. But this was the very first one. And what was happening this day, he, he was trying to be alone for a few minutes. And you know, for him, that was very difficult. He was never, he was never alone. He always had someone with him. So he went outside and he was going to stand around and just relax and pray a little bit. And the crowds started to gather around him. So he went and sat on the boat. And the crowds got bigger and bigger, so he pushed off a little bit. So he could get out on the water, and his voice carried better over the water anyway. So he was out there sitting on the boat, and he was starting to talk to the people. And he gave them this parable. Now, the disciples had come to him earlier and told him that they were having trouble recruiting they were having trouble getting people to come in to the church. So he wanted to answer them, and what he told them was a farmer was planting seeds. Well, when, you know, when you go out to plant seeds and you got the ground all prepared, there's always an edge around, around this land that you didn't plow. And they always used to leave that edge for several reasons, number one, if any seed got over there and it grew, they left it for the, for the hungry and the poor people. They didn't harvest it. But in some areas, you know, even in your yard, you plant grass, you got some soil that's a little hard, and it's little rocks underneath it. And you've got some soil that's, that's got some weeds in it that you can't work with. But then you have the good soil. Well, what he was saying is, there are lots of people that come to hear him. And they're like the ground. 
They do the same thing. Some of them hear him, and they go, oh, I don't want anything to do with this. I mean, this soil fell off on the sides, and the birds ate it up. So these people, they heard him, but they didn't want to listen to him. And then there were the people who jumped on it right away. Oh, yeah, I'm so excited. Oh, excuse me. They got jumped on this right away, and they thought, oh, I'm, I'm really enthralled with this. This is wonderful. But the next day, they'd forgotten all about it. So it was like a seed that fell on the rocks. Right away, it, it grew. But it didn't have any roots, so they, they didn't last. And then there were the people who, when the, when the seeds got spread into the weeds, they were never going to come on board. The devil, the devil were those weeds. All those weeds represented the devil. And, and they weren't going to overcome and get away from him. So you knew you were going to lose them. But his goal was to go for the good soil. Where you had some good, nice, black soil. In Texas, we have black clay. That's not good. But here, they have some good soil, but you have to look for it. When he planted those seeds, and those seeds took, then the crop grew strong and grew big, and it grew healthy. And this is... This is what we have here today. We have the crop that caught on, who has good roots, and who, who follows the word of Jesus Christ, and who believes. And so this is what this parable was all about. But they were having a lot of problems recruiting because they kept running into roadblocks. Now, have you ever run into a roadblock someplace when you were in a hurry trying to get somewhere? Always, people put up roadblocks in front of you all the time. You ask somebody to come to church, and they say, uh, "Gee, you know, I don't know. That's it's not really my thing." We say, "Well, you know, just come for a visit." And he said, "Well, let me think about it for a few days, and I'll let you know." Well, you know what that means. They're not coming. But then there's those that. You've got to get in a spot, and you've got to get there in a hurry. And you're going to church, and you're coming down the road, and you're headed right here, and you've got to be there, and you're running late. Got a couple minutes. I can see the church right there. I can make it. I'm going to make it in time. The road's closed. Somebody dug a trench, and they got the road blocked off, and you can't get to the church. Well, it would be okay, except when your pastor is. <laughs> That's not a good thing. If you're the pastor, you got to be there, right? So you've got to plan for those things. But people put up these roadblocks in front of them to keep them from having to do things. And it takes a lot to get past those roadblocks, and Jesus had to take the time to explain to his, his uh, disciples that this was not an uncommon thing. And a lot of times you'll be doing something and, and things will happen, and you know darn well that you've tried everything you could do to get there. When I, my first job as a salesman, uh, I was a salesman. I admit that. I was on the road for 40 years. <clears throat> but my very first job as a salesman, I had a man who I went to work for as an associate salesman. And he was, oh, about this tall. A little Italian guy, and he was feisty. Oh, he was he was something else to work for. And he told me, he says, "Let me tell you something. I don't care what you're doing. If we have an appointment at a certain time, you get your butt there on time, and you don't be late." And this was like my second week on the job, and he was really giving it to me. I mean, he was checking on me all the time. What are you doing? What are you doing? Well. We had worked for a company that had developed a plastic box and it had a spout on it and you could fill it with water and put it in the refrigerator and dispense water. This was, this was before they had the bottled water, right? This was years ago. And we had a deal with one of the big water companies to meet with them that morning and show them this product and see if we could get them to take it on. 
when we're coming down the freeway, we didn't have any cell phones. There was a car wreck right in front of me. I'm the third car behind the wreck. <clears throat> and there's no way off the freeway. This is California. There's no way to get off that freeway. I was there. And there was not a thing I could do about it. And he says, I don't care. You get somebody, you get to a phone, and you call me and tell me you're going to be late. I couldn't. And I was a nervous wreck. Oh, goodness, I'm going to lose my job. I had this big meeting with the water company, and it's not going to work. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know I'm going to catch all kinds of heck when I get to where I'm going. And I was an hour and a half stuck on that freeway. Well, uh, what am I going to do? I got, I'm going to make this, I'm going to this appointment, I'm going to say, hey, I'm late, but would you see me anyway? Well, I got there and I'm, I look around, my boss is not there. Well, he, he left. And just as I'm getting out of the car to go into the building, he pulls up, he was the sixth car in line behind me. <laughs> hey, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> But these are the things that happen, and you think they're by accident? No, they're not by accident. These are things that happen. You go around a corner, and you made a wrong turn. You find a new restaurant. Wow, oh, I didn't know that restaurant was there. That's pretty neat. Or you, you go to a, you go someplace where you never should have been. You don't know why you got invited to this place. I was invited to a Hanukkah party. <laughs> I'm not Jewish, but my wife was working for a fellow who was Jewish, and he was having a Hanukkah party, so they invited us up. So we went, and while I'm there, uh, I don't know anybody, I'm just kind of walking around in the days looking at this beautiful mansion up in the Hollywood Hills. This lady comes up and starts talking to me. What do you do? What do you do for a living? Well, at that time, I was a grocery clerk for uh, Hughes Markets. And she said, oh, you know, you ought to go to thrifty drug stores. Thrifty drug stores is hiring, and they're hiring managers. I said, oh, that sounds great. I'll do that. I wasn't going to do that. So my first day off, my wife is working, and she calls up and says, are you going to thrifty today to uh, put an application in? I said, uh, I'm going to play tennis. He says, I think you ought to go to Thrifty and put that application in. I said, mm, okay. So I did. My friend and I, he drove, we were going to go play tennis. He drove me down it was about 30 miles to Thrifty's headquarters. And I went in and figured I could fill out an application, be out of there in 15 minutes, and back on the tennis court and work that way. Passed all the things. We got a series of tests we want you to take. Oh, brother. This went on for a while. and. And he says, well, listen, it's lunchtime. We're all going to go to lunch. Why don't I take you and your friend to lunch? Okay. So we went to lunch, came back. I got an IQ test I want you to take. Mm -hmm. Come on, you're taking my whole day and my tennis match is coming down the drain. Well, to make a long story short, they hired me. And on the way down there, we went past one of the thrifty drugstores, and I had told my friend, see that store? I'm going to work over there. We were making a joke out of it. I'll be darned. They put me in that church, in that store, as an assistant manager. I became, uh, 10 years I was with Thrifty, and I became a buyer for them. I was buying in the office, and it changed my whole life. That Hanukkah party. Now, what was I doing there? You don't think somebody had a hand in that? I became a buyer for Thrifty drugstores, and from there I went into sales. And from sales, I went into my own sales organization. And from there, I went into the Lamps Plus stores, and I was helping them sell their lamps, and they hired me on and made me a vice president in charge of all the marketing and sales for Lamps Plus stores. Well, Lamps Plus stores is a $500 million company. How did a kid with high school graduation only, a little bit of college, had a couple of years, wind up as a vice president of marketing and sales for a company by, by Lamps Plus? changed my whole life. And after I retired, we moved here. And I loved it here. I told you that before, I loved it here. But I started a whole new career being here. 
So then I'm thinking, you know, how does Jesus select these people, or God select the people to do the jobs he wants them to do? Does he pick the most handsome? No. Does he pick uh, the smartest? No. Does he pick the hardest worker? Mm -hmm. A little bit. But he picks people who are just common, ordinary people, and he guides them to do the job he wants them to do because they'll follow him. I'll give you a couple examples. Did you know Moses was an arrogant princeling who turned into a murderer? Moses. Joseph was an empty-headed kid with delusions of grandeur who was too stupid to keep his mouth shut around his brothers. I mean, this is pretty tough. Jonah thought he could hide from God. That didn't help him much. Paul persecuted the early Christians. Zacharias was a little guy. Remember him, Zacharias? Who uh, defrauded most of the community. Abraham conceived the child with his wife's handmaiden because he was too impatient to wait for God. Now, if you're reading this list, and this list goes on and on and on, Isaac was a 40-year-old virgin living with his parents until his dad sent out and had Rebecca brought to him as a bride. These are not great people. These are not people who are, are uh, really prone to do everything right. But you know, a good salesman has to overcome a lot of obstacles. And I, I think they say it takes calling on the same person 11 times before he realizes you're not going away and he gives you an order. I called on a company, a big grocery company, in California, Smith's Foods. And I went in there one day and I had a sales manager who didn't like me. <laughs> What's not to like, right? <laughs> no, he didn't like me. So he told my boss, he says, listen, if he doesn't write $10,000 in business for me this month, I want you to fire him. Well, the month had gone by. I was on the last day. I had written zero for this company. Nothing. And I know I'm going back to the office to get fired. And I've got a wife, two kids. So I went to call on Smith's Foods. And the man says to me, Hiram, I'm a mason. And we call each other Hiram. I said, Hiram, what's, what's your problem today? There's something wrong with you. And I had called on him many times before, but never really much success. And I said, oh, nothing, just, it just, he says, no, I want to know, what's going on? I said, well, I was told that if I didn't write a $10,000 month that I was going to be terminated today. He said, well, how much have you written? I said, nothing. I had a good month last month, but this month, all my orders just got shipped. I can't get any reorders. I got a big fat zero sitting. He says, get your cat over there. He wrote me an order for $10,000. God works in mysterious ways. He is always there with us. He helps us. He guides us. He keeps us going. And you never know when you're going to turn that corner and find something special. Isn't that what's wonderful about Jesus Christ and God? He doesn't give you pre-notice that this is happening. He just guides you. He takes you there. And, and he leads you to your goal. And all I can say to that is, Hallelujah and Amen. So, give in. You know, you can't hide from God. Jonah tried. He got thrown overboard. Run up in the belly of a whale. Didn't help. But you can't help from God. So give in. Give in to him. Accept him. Love him. Cherish him. When he tells you to do something, just do it. Because you are not going to get away from it. You are not. So accept it. Welcome it. And thank God 
that he watches over us and takes care of us all the time. Thank you, Lord, for all your many, many blessings. You know, you'll be surprised at how much you can accomplish when you put your faith in God. Amen.